I'm doing a giveaway for the game versus Riyadi. I'm giving 10 free tickets for whoever liked this uh, video comment mm. and subscribe in the comment just like they have just to leave a comment that they subscribe and they will have a chance to win a free ticket versus suggest um riyadh the suggest and Hazir. so you give 10 tickets i'll give 10 tickets how about that so guys <laughs> if you like if you like subscribe you're going to be able to you know win a one of 20 tickets or two of 20 tickets so for me playing for for suggest that is kind of like where I realize my potential. Do you feel like you can win the league? Uh, I mean, me personally, I want them to win the league. Who will be the five five weeks? I will coach Bedouye best five weeks. Damn. Who's the best Lebanese player you played with in Lebanon? I'm probably going to get crucified for this. I love playing with Rodrik. When I put on the Lebanese jersey, you know, it's a, it's a great honor and it's a great pride. One thing that people don't understand is that I got a lot of backlash for leaving reality. Wait, is the game in Gazir or is it in Manara? I was with the Lakers making a whole lot of money, but I wasn't really happy. My agent quit. He quit on me. He's like, bro, you crazy. My dad, he was uh, arrested, you know, for political reasons. Just one night, you know, my mom woke me up and she was like, yo, we got to go. Next thing I knew, I was in the airport being escorted by a whole bunch of police and army. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Maybe you can talk a little bit. Maybe you can talk a little bit. So, Atar Majak, I'm so happy to have you today. You're one of the most recognizable players in Lebanon. Um, you won the 2022 Balch African Championship, and you were the best defender player in the Ball 2022 Championship. You also helped Lebanon win the 2022 Arab Championship in Dubai. You were also drafted by Los Angeles Lakers. You play in the States. I'm so happy to have you. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. How are you doing today and how's the preparation with the Sages Club? Uh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Uh, still trying to get used to the system and uh, get used to the players and the atmosphere. Um, I'm doing good. I mean, we play, you know, my brother Ibrahima uh, in a couple of days. So that's always an intense game. Uh, it's the battle of the family. So, you know, who's taking home the bragging rights for Christmas? Yeah, right. You know, Atar, I was telling one of my friends, she's not into basketball, and I was telling her that uh, Atar Majak is going to be my next my next guest. And she told me like, oh, Majak, the guy, like <laughs> she remembers the commentator. He always say yeah. your name and she, she always has this in mind. How does it feel being back in Lebanon? You've been through a lot of stuff, especially in Lebanon, like you played with Chanville, Riyadh, Sages Club. How does it feel right now to be back in Lebanon? Uh, I mean, it feels good. Uh, it feels like being back home, uh, you know, despite of how many countries that I end up going to and signing and the tempting offers, somehow I always <laughs> make a stop over here. So I'm, I'm definitely tied to, to the country somehow, some way. So it feels good. You know, it feels like back home. You know, this is like my second home, my third home. So really, what's your first home? Uh, well, I live in America. Um, you know, my family, my mom live in Australia and, uh, my dad and the rest of my family live in South Sudan. So I guess this will be my fourth home. Okay. Wow. So you were born in Sudan, but moved to the States or Australia first, right? Uh, I was born in Khartoum, uh, Sudan and, uh, Republic of Sudan now. And then, uh, I moved to Egypt for a few years and then, uh, moved to Australia, uh, spent a little bit of time in Australia and then moved to the States. How did you move between all those places? Like, how did you end up being in Egypt first and then moving to Australia? Uh, man, it's, it's, it's a crazy story. Uh, I mean, you know, I was born into a political family, you know, a lot of politicians in the family, a lot of military generals, da da da, da so on, you know. And, uh, you know, it's the... I don't know if, it's, if I should call it the the luck of the draw, or whatever it is, um, and things just started going left, you know, for for everybody within our community, uh, which is like the the African South Sudan, like the African Sudanese at the time, or the South Sudanese, and uh, the war, the civil war, um, people getting arrested, people getting assassinated, and things were just going left. 
Um, so just one night, you know, my mom woke me up and she was like, yo, we got to go. Um, and next thing I knew, I was in the airport being escorted by a whole bunch of police and army into a plane. Didn't know where I was going. Landed. Uh, I think it was like seven or eight in the morning in Cairo. So didn't I didn't even know until later on that what was ha really happening. So that's the thing you, you I was watching another podcast uh, a soccer podcast about Delhi Ali I don't know if you know him but I was watching how hard sometimes is like people you don't know where they come from right you don't know the childhood you don't know what you've been through and that's a very I mean, rough start so you're just saying you're just moving the next day to Egypt and then from Egypt there you move to Australia right yeah yeah and then from Egypt uh my dad after being released you know from prison uh because he was a uh, uh arrested you know for political reasons um he came to egypt he came to join us in egypt and then uh he got political asylums in uh in australia that's a really interesting story i didn't know about that but uh i want to know a, more not about a, not it. a lot of people not a lot of people know about it um you know the thing about it is just like everybody always wants that story wants that sad sob story he grew up in the hood uh nah i'm not giving you no excuse to to, to feel sorry for me i'm coming right. every day i'm living right. my life i don't look backwards i always look forward so i really you know unless if you ask you ain't really gonna know you know because i don't i don't want nobody to have any sort of feeling be like oh yeah he grew up in the hood oh yeah he grew up in a war-torn country and look at him now no you know i have the same chances as everybody you know from jump street so yeah, you know, sometimes it's not about feeling sorry, but it's about like those situations and this like childhood or those changes, they make you strong, stronger later. Maybe you were not seeing that at the moment, but I see it's not like feeling sorry. It's making you stronger. And later, like here you are, like a pro basketball player. And um, I feel those situations and actions are super uh, meaningful sometimes when you reflect and see it and then we just, you know, make you stronger and keep moving. Yeah. No, I mean, you're definitely right. But uh, at the same time, it's like, you know, when you talk about your story and you look back and you, if somebody has it worse, um, you know, for me, I always think, you know, there's always people that have it worse. I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to be at whatever stage in life that I was in. So I don't I don't look at myself as anything special. So I don't really talk about it, you know, because I'm like, you know, there's kids in Congo, you know, there's kids, you know, in all over the place, you know, that, that have it worse than me. So. Right. You just be grateful at this point, right? How do you see yeah. it? Do you see like being grateful or I should even work harder to keep doing more stuff? Uh, I mean, well, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful every day, you know, um, you know, being alive, like a lot of people don't understand, like, Growing up in the places that I grew up, you know, just being alive is is, is something that I'm grateful for. Uh, and that's why, you know, basketball has, you know, has saved my life. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is just like, like, dude, you know, you, you've, you've been given everything to be successful. Um, and, and I have been successful. And now I'm in a stage of my life where it's like, you know, all those blessings that was still upon you. It's time for you to like you know return that to the universe so that's that's basically kind of like what i focus on you know partnership like with but with basketball and my job you know my my nine my day-to-day -day job so and you started realizing all of that at an early age or right now you're at a point in your career at 36 year old you're actually realizing everything like what's happening when did you feel like you started being aware of all of that and you should like keep pushing um i mean it, it's uh i don't know it's just like it's a learning you know it's a trial and error you know for me growing up in the state i didn't have my family didn't have nobody to look up to nobody to take care of me you know being a young kid making a lot of mistakes and uh learning from that and then you know kind of keep adding on to the experience of life and everything that you go through from day to day and learning and you know today when when i wake up in the morning i'm just like okay like what can i do today to change somebody's life you know um what you know what can i do to influence somebody to to be better uh whether it's in basketball whether it's in life whether it's you know somebody you see in the street you know what message can you spread from everything that i've learned 
you know. Um, so it's a, it's a it's an ongoing learning thing, um, and it's just whenever I learn something, I always try to give it back. So, or whenever I'm blessed with something, I always try to bless somebody else. You know, this is what I, I really felt a connection when I was texting you on Instagram. And the way you just responded to me, I was shocked. I wasn't honestly um, aware that you're going to be responding to me first. And you're like, yeah, I'm in. Just tell me where, tell me what time, and I'm in. So I love that energy that you provided to me. And I was so excited about it. And that's why one of the reason you're here today and the story yeah. behind it, you can, you can see how sometimes people, they have a story. And then when they start acting, you feel that you can relate that story to the actions. And this is what, what I'm feeling right now with you and just talking to you. So that's absolutely awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, man, I'm human. Um, uh, I'm probably one of the few, basketball players or somebody who has a name who actually sit there and actually respond to to the fans and show love you know um man everybody you know for me i just look at myself as a human who's been given a platform to do the right thing and i try to do the right thing you know so when people message me certain messages and certain things ask me questions you know they want me to do something um you know i'm always down to to to, to do the you know the right thing basically and for me it's just like me coming here and talking, you never know who is going to hear this message, anything that I have to say, who's going to take a positive thing out of it, you know, who's going to be motivated, who's going to, you know, who am I, whose life am I going to change? You know, you never know. Everything is a chain of events in life. Everything, you know, one thing leads, leads to another. And, you know, so for me, it was kind of like, all right, cool, I'm in. So you were saying about trying and error. I really like this metaphor, if you want. Like sports, sometimes it's like a metaphor about life. What kind of situation in life or during your career you felt like, okay, you did something wrong or you actually learned that you have to be humble and just give, give to people or give to the fans or respond. I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's something um, behind it and a specific situation that clicked and you started doing that and applying that. Can you a little bit expand on that? Um, I mean, it, it wasn't really a specific thing. It was just like, you know, growing up, like, it was just like blessings upon blessings, you know, going from, from Australia, going to, you know, Heat Academy uh, in, in Virginia, and then going to UConn and, and being recruited so highly and, and, and being in the NBA border, uh, NBA, you know, uh, scouting list and, you know, being on the public image and being blessed, right? Um, it was just all about me, 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 me. And I really never realized that it wasn't about me. It was bigger than me. Uh, I was just being given these blessings so I can pass it on. Um, and then, you know, everything kind of kept adding on, adding on. And when, you know, when I got drafted to the Lakers and, you know, went to training camp and went to summer league, came back, you know, and had my injury, um, you know, had my knee injury. And that's when I kind of started clicking for me because when I had my injury, uh, I went through a period of time where I wasn't talking to nobody, you know, all those, you know, quote unquote, you know, friends were gone. Uh, the only person that was around was, you know, really my day ones, you know, which is my mom, my brothers and stuff like that. And when I went back home, you know, my mom basically was like, you know, you, you still have a platform to do, you know, things and, and to change people's lives. Uh, so I started going out into the community, uh, you know, started working with kids, started giving, you know, I gave away everything. Like I had literally a storage room full of shoes, clothes, you know, different things that, you know, was given to me by Adidas and Nike at the time. And I just started giving them out, did camps, you know, for free. Um, and look down the line 10 years down the line uh you have the national the south sudan national team going to the world cup and qualifying for the olympics and half of that team <laughs> there were those kids that uh you know i was uh making them you know run at seven in the morning with me and making sure that they you know get in the gym and you know i used to go to the club and and i'll see them in the club and i'll be like chasing them home i'll have to call police on them to escort them home you know make them wake up at four in the morning certain things you know and those kids now, you know, if you look at them, you know, you have, you know, Junior, you have Deng Chul, uh, you have, you know, all these different guys, you know. Now they, they're all professionals. They're playing in the national team. They're playing in the biggest stage. You know, they're going to the Olympics. So, you know, that's kind of like 
basically an example of kind of like what I've been through so and how I give back so right right it's, it's it's about giving i feel it's about giving and receiving the more you give the more you don't like focus on really trying to do like specific intentions just by giving you will receive and i think that's one of the reason like pro athletes they make it to the level because you just have to give up stuff and just you know give up shoes in your case and all of that so that's that's a really cool thing and, and so even you know giving up your time it's it's not just materialistic things. It's like most people think it's like okay, giving money or giving shoes is, right, is, is right. something. I mean, in some situations, giving somebody a pair of shoes it goes like it means the world. But so in some situations, it's like you know, telling a kid like, "Yo, you know, do the right thing. I care. I care about you." You know that that can change somebody's life. Yeah, especially time like you were mentioning, it's not something that you can pay for it, right? But sometimes like if you give time away, it's like you're giving money away because time is money, right? If you're really sacrificing and doing something and building and putting some energy to it, it will later, you know, you'll get result from it because you're investing in time and that what people, they don't see it or at, at least some ballers, they don't see it. Like a lot of people, they want just money. But if you just sacrifice time, maybe some energy too, maybe years, but you'll get some result. Did you feel like any time in your career you just gave up a lot of money just for time to really work on yourself and you knew that if you sacrifice that money for time, you will, you know, be on a next level or somewhere else? Um, I mean, you know, you give up money every day. For me, money is a, is a, is a man-made concept to control my mind and for me I don't look at money as really it's something that important I mean it makes things work it makes things easier it makes life easier but for me it's not something important you know for me human connection building relationships and uh, that goes a long you know long way um, you know me basically like I don't really like spend money on too much like I don't I mean shoes <laughs> you know and the usual uh, right the usual no, not really the usual. I mean, you know, shoes, taking care of my family. And, uh, you know, my biggest thing is, like, uh, learning from great players that I've been around over time. Uh, it's always investing into your body. You know, people say you have to reinvest into, into, into your business, into, you know, what makes you money. And I've realized that my body is the one that makes me money. So I started reinvesting. You know, I, t I pay a lot of money to take care of my body. Uh, over the years and you know now I'm getting the results you know anybody who's 36 will not be looking like me or playing like me or running like me or jumping like me because you know it's I'm, ge I'm getting those sacrifices and that money that I've paid you know a long time ago right so the money that you're investing on your body you don't have return but you have wealth and that wealth you can't get it anywhere exactly I mean yeah, you, you know the like longevity of my career Right, and you're still 36 and traveling all over the world, and that's really impressive. And now playing with Sajas at 36, doing amazing. So that's that's the longevity we're talking about, right? It's about investing in yourself. That's actually yeah. really good. I thought I want to go back a little bit to the NBA. You said you you were drafted by the Los Angeles Lakers, and you played with them, right, for a couple of years. What happened exactly there? Um, yeah, I mean. It's it just like me personally to sum up the story, and I, you know I can go back deeper into it. Um, when when it, when something is not written for you, it's just not gonna happen, regardless of how much you try, you know. And for me, it's like my peace, my happiness is more important than anything. Um, you know, being with the Lakers, you know, for for two years, then going to the D League, you know, with the Lakers and getting hurt twice, you know. Um, I remember I got hurt the day before I was supposed to officially sign my, you know, my, my contract with the Lakers. Um, it was just like, you know what? This is not the journey you're supposed to take. Um, and and then going back home to Australia to do, you know, rehab and recover, um, I've realized that I was much more happier doing that. And then I end up going to, to China and I was having the best time of my life. And I was like, wait, hold up. So I was with the Lakers making a whole lot of money, but I wasn't really happy, you know. 
but then now I'm playing in China and I'm 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 in Foshan, a small ass city, you know, in Timbuktu, and I'm having the time of my life. And I, and I was just like, hey, you know, maybe the NBA is not is not that important. And really, I just kind of decided not to really pursue it anymore. Um, despite even after me playing in China, after me traveling, you know, throughout Europe, you know, I had two contracts, you know, for, from, from the Lakers for vet minimum and certain, I was just like, eh, I really, I really left it in my email and never looked at it. My agent looked at me like I was crazy. My agent quit, quit. He quit on me. He's like, bro, you crazy. And I was like, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, that's all that matters to me where I find peace, where I'm happy. That's, that's the most important thing for me. Right, right. So did you feel like, let's say you stayed a little bit longer with the Lakers, but you sacrificed a little bit of time not being happy. Do you feel like later on you can regain that happiness or maybe you can see it in another way or maybe you can, I don't know, maybe try to have the experience, even if you're not happy, but try to get some knowledge as long as you can implement that in your daily life or in your basketball, even you know that you're not happy at the moment or that sacrifice of happiness. Do you feel you can a little bit postpone it to maybe make it better later? So I'm just wondering a little bit because you were on a level like playing with the NBA and I totally understand you can, you can sometimes be like not happy even if you're with the NBA, but maybe sacrificing a little bit and maybe, you know, able to play later better and be happy. What do you think about that? Or have you thought about that? Mm. I mean, again, you know, that, that goes into also me being young at the time and not having really people around me that advise me to do the right thing. You know, um, my parents don't know nothing about basketball world. Uh, at the time, you know, the person who was representing me was all about money, didn't really care about my well-being or none of that. Um, so it was just like, yeah, I could have sacrificed a little bit more, but it was like, I felt myself like throughout the years, like once I got drafted, it was like that first three, four months, it was the honeymoon phase and I was having a good time, enjoying, you know, going to the locker room, looking good, wearing Laker stuff, going out, saying I'm a Laker, da, 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 all of that stuff. And then after that four months, it was just like, I just started declining. Like I didn't really, you know, care for nothing, didn't, you know, I, I felt like I was losing myself slowly. You know, I was losing myself and it was just like, it was just like a decision that once I make a decision, I'm not going back. It is what it is. I'll live the consequences. So it was just a decision that I made once I got hurt. I was just like, you know what, forget it. Like, you know, I'm going to have to live with it. But also at the time with the Lakers, it was like, you know, I've learned a lot. Um, you know, being around players, you know, like Gary Payton, you know, Kobe, different players, you know, uh, Steve Nash and stuff like that. You know, you, I've learned a lot, you know. A lot of people ask me, how do you play defense like that? Like, you know, your timing, da 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 Dude, I learned from the best. Gary Payton was my mentor. He, you know, he, he taught me a lot. He taught me how to, you know, because I'm a tall player, guarding a short player, use distance, use my length, you know, how to how to look quick when you're not as quick, you know. Um, so I've, le I've definitely learned a lot that, you know, definitely helped me out through my career. So that definitely was like a place that I was meant to be at that time. And and then I, it served this purpose and I was more than happy to move on and continue right, my journey right. in life. That's a, that's a good way to put it. What was your best time or best moment in your career? Uh, my best time my best time that's a tough one huh <laughs> yeah it's tough man cuz i had a, I, i've had a lot of good times I, you know i've i've had a a happy career uh, if i should put it um i mean i'll say one of one of the best times uh was was being on the same team as uh as uh, Tracy McGrady uh, uh big mac so you know that was like he was an idol for so long you know it was just like me being you know growing up you know playing you know the three and you know him and vince were like my idols so like when i finally got to be in a team with him in china it was just like whoa you know i was kind of like a bit starstruck 
and also his humility, like how he looked at me as a little brother until today, you know, our relationship is still, you know, very close. It was just like, definitely that's something that I would cherish. So China was one of the best time um, for you. You feel like the environment helped you, um, the team helped you, or it was just you were in your peak. What was the main reason of your happiness? Because you mentioned that you were really happy there. Uh, I don't know. It's just like, I guess like that's when I realized that traveling and, and playing basketball and just traveling was, was fun for me. Um, you know, going to a new country and, and like the Chinese people, how they are and, and trying to speak Mandarin at the time when I didn't know the lick of word. Um, it was just it was just a good time, you know, and then playing in the same team with T-Mac. It was just like, man, we go to a mall, you have 6,000, 7,000 fans you know want to take pictures of you and it was just kind of like you know uh, like a lot of fun i had i definitely had a good time right are you still do you still speak mandarin or no you lost that <laughs> small, 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 small. small small how many languages you do you speak yeah i mean i speak arabic english a little bit of swahili a little bit of mandarin uh and come on you I speak, speak arabic Dinka. fluent oh okay كثير منيح لو بدك بحكي عربي مصري لبناني لكن عملناه بالعربي لكن انا ماني عارف لكن انه بتحكي عربي يلا بنكفي بالعربي لكن حلو هيك بنبلش انجلش فور لا لا خليه انجليزي احسن هلا بنوصل على الكيو ان ايز وي سبيك ان عربيك بيكوز كيو ان ايز ايفريثينج اول ذا كويشن از ان عربيك اوكي so um how do you keep pushing so i i was checking your instagram it's all about like training and like you know just investing time to yourself but at 36 how do you feel like your body is responding and how your game has changed and how much time or years you still have in basketball uh we go um, i mean i got about two three more years maybe maybe four i mean i can push it to four um me, you know, like, I, honestly, when you come to a game and, and, and you look at a lot of kids, me, I love kids, you know. Um, when I look at all these young kids and, and, and these people that come to the game and pay all this money to come watch you play, that that is my motivation to keep pushing, you know. Uh, that is, like, basic. I think that's, like, one of my motivations. And also... It's like, you know, representing people, you know. Um, I have different flags that I wear, and it's like you're wearing those flags, you're representing those people. And if you don't wake up and do the work, then you're not doing the right thing by those people. Uh, those people that put you in a pedestal, you know, you owe them you putting that time in, in the gym. And one thing that I've realized is that you know, working on your body goes a long way. So, you know, I've I've I've, I've invested in working my body. You know, always being in shape, um, and and re my recovery is a bit slower now, and I understand. But I also like use recovery methods. I invest a lot, and in, I invest a lot of money in recovery. You know, so uh, yeah, that's that, that's basically what you know my motivation. Right. Is. So if you, I just want to uh, take a small uh, time to just do a small comparison so i was talking to a a big athlete here in the states and he told me that the way he was training at 20 or 25 is so much different that he's training right now and the way he's eating right now you feel like it's day to day and you just work on longevity and try to invest um, um you know just time in the gym so you can push more and you you stay a little bit less time in the field because you actually are a master about all the moves all the skills so it's more about maintenance and really being able to maintain all of that and not actually like pushing and pushing every day a hundred percent so the good enough spot i feel it's very important and this is what athlete i feel like sometimes they just fade out if you push too much too soon you're just going to fade out like how did you stay consistent with all of that i mean you traveled all over the world you play in new zealand australia lebanon the states in africa too how did you maintain that consistency with all those changes 
Um, well, the thing is, for me, it's not about, you know, it, it doesn't have to just do with basketball and longevity. Uh, when, I, when it comes to, like, the weight room training, taking care of my body, it's about when I'm 70, when I'm 80 years old, you know, God, you know, if God, you know, gives it to me. Um, you know, for me, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't depend on nobody to do anything for me. So I'm trying to make sure that when I get to that point that I'm able to do it myself. So, you know, I, I still go hard. You know, I still go hard in the gym and, and I'm not doing it for longevity. I'm doing it for, you know, I can I can still do it, you know. Um, and basically, like, it, it, a lot of people don't understand. You know, here in Lebanon, uh, I have, you know, my, my own personal trainer that I, I use. Um, a lot of countries that I go to, uh, I have I have a personal, also a personal trainer that travels with me. Um, you know, they get... You know, they get salary, they get paid, whatever. They, you know, they have the equipment. Um, you know, that's just the so priority. So you don't use the person trainer of the team. You just hire one just for yourself. No, I have two. I have two trainers that I've had for for a very long time. That, that uh, one is in Lebanon, and then uh, one is uh, Portuguese, uh, Angolan. So, and he travels. With, he's more flexible to travel with me. Uh, into a lot of places that I go, so that I I just travel with them. When I'm in Lebanon, I use you know my Lebanese trainer, and he's flexible too. He traveled with me a couple places, so you know. But how I do you feel them. like Lebanon is different from um, the other places you played with? I'm not talking about um, you know just being professional, all of that. The environment that you get from Lebanon, how is it different from other places? You better show up every game. Because if you don't show up and you, you sh somebody else shows you out, you might be on the next flight smoking. <laughs> that's a, that's how it go. So it's no it's no nah it's no game out here. It's um, I mean, Lebanon is a great league, and I and I feel like there's still a lot a long way to go. Uh, you know, the federation's been doing a great job uh, building the league and trying to do their best with all this. You know, the situations that have happened. Um, so. You know the league is going through a right direction, and uh, they're doing the right thing. What do you expect this so. year with Sasha's club? Do you feel like you can win the league? Uh, I mean, me personally, I want them to win the league. Um, you know, I want Coach Jai to win the league. Um, you know, because I feel like he deserves it. Uh, he's worked hard. Um, you know, I want the players uh, on on the Sajaz team. Uh, and for me personally, I feel like. So jazz fans deserve it with everything that they've been through over the years, over the past few years. I think like they deserve it, you know, and and that would change the course of the club. And I think right, they've been through a lot. It. Like how many games, how many times they reached the final? They didn't win a single time like the past years, and they still are very loyal. And that's the thing. Like I feel like how can you be that still... much loyal at a point where you just you know that you can do it, but you're not doing it. I mean, I feel that's a big plus for Sajes fans. And you feel like those fans are pushing you to play better. And how do you compare it with other teams? Like you played with Riyadi and Chonville too. How was it and how's the different environment between um, Sajes and other clubs? I mean, you know, for me playing for, for Sajes, um, you know, that is kind of like where I realize my potential, you know, where I realize what I could become, you know. I mean, I've always known I'm a great player. I've shown I can play. I've, you know, had the 30-point games with other teams in the past, and I've, you know, had the superstardom and all that stuff. Uh, but to Jazz, you know, it, it, it made me grow in my game and made me grow in life when I was playing with the Jazz, so it's always going to have a special place in my heart. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's kind of like when the Jazz calls, it's like, all right, like, hey, man, I'll put on that green uniform. So, um, you know, but also, like, a lot of clubs in Lebanon, they, they, every club is special in its own way. Every club is special in its own way. When you go, once you're in, you know, you have, you know, the Shanvilles, you know, like when you go to the Myers School, it's like, you're representing a school like it's like you're back in college you're back in you know you you got to do your thing you know um you have the reality it's like when you go in that court you know just the the rumbling of the fans is like you know it's like it's game time so like every every team has its own niche where it pushes them 
and it keeps the fans coming back. You know, even if they don't win, and then you 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 have you know, Homeman, you you're representing a whole community. You know, you representing a whole community, and so you have like different things with different teams that always motivate players. Right, to, that's to a good keep way to put it. Like you're in a community. Like I, I was a suggest. Um, I was in a suggest in high school. Uh, I was there for only two years, and I felt like I'm part of a community really quick. Like I adapted really quick. We used to watch like basketball games. Everything was about basketball, and that's like a really good role model when you you're in school and see like the players later playing and that's we don't see a lot overseas if you think about it we're in i don't know you tell me if i'm wrong but i i never saw a place where you have a school that have a professional actually team that is combined to it like they they are actually they have fans or they have players that comes out from this school i feel this is like very precious too Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, definitely. I don't think I've been around, so anywhere. I mean, I, I think the only place that I've played in that had a school, I think it's uh, Göttingen uh, in the BBL in Germany. So Göttingen is, is, is also a school. So I think that might be like the only other case, you know, but their fans is not as crazy as the Jazz fans. So they, they're nowhere comparison. Um, but for me, I put like, you know, the Jazz fans up there with the, with the partisans and the, you know, uh, Bashiktash and the, you know, even the monastery right. fans are crazy. You know, the, the monastery fans are crazy. I put them up there. They're all like in a do, whole different Do you feel category. like Sajest fan or monastery fans are crazier? <laughs> Man, it's, it's, I mean, look, when, when we won the championship or we won the cup, we, so monastery is about, three hours drive from from Tunis we had a convoy of maybe I want to say like 10,000 people for three hours straight that trip took us instead of taking us three hours the trip took us I think it was like almost 11 hours you know because of the because of the convoy and, and I'm just like and every time we want I won a championship in Monastery, it's always been the same like the littlest the littlest championship you win the littlest rivalry you win you get in a parade, like, you know, so it's just, that's how crazy it is. I mean, so Jazz fans, I'm pretty sure if we, you know, if they win a championship this year, I'm pretty sure it's going to be kind of like that crazy too. So Yeah, I man, best of luck with the Sajas this year. I really want them to win. I feel they can. And you said, you mentioned that your brother is here too, right? Yeah, I mean, Ibrahim and Thomas, you know. That's yeah, right. So that's a, this is what I want to talk about. How did you yeah. grow up? You said like your parents, they weren't supportive about basketball or didn't know anything. How did you, both of you guys, you started playing basketball from a young age? I mean, I mean, I didn't start basketball until I was like 14. So, uh, and even when I was playing, I was kind of like really not all the way in um, until I really kind of saw what basketball can provide to me. Uh, that's when I kind of like jumped in all the way. But I mean, my, my dad always wanted me to follow the family traditions and go to university, get a law degree, you know. That's the typical, politics, right? That's the typical. That. You know, that's what. A, yeah. You know, and, and and for me, you know, I always have passion. I, I, I have passion for that. It's, it was like naturally given to me, you know, even now, like you see me sitting there reading, you know, different books, you know, looking at different articles, doing different research, trying to acknowledge myself. Um, so that's, I have that passion already. Uh, but then it's just like, when I started playing basketball, it was just like, I, I got to a point where I was just like, dude, like I can go to university for free, you know? So <laughs> let me go to university for free at least. And then, you know, my parents said, all right, like work hard, go to university for free. Once you're done, then we'll, we'll figure it out. And then I went there for, for two years. I realized I was like, I can get paid doing this, a lot of money. And my dad was like, all right, like, you still got to come to the family business, though. So, and I was like, yeah, you know, a few years down the line, you know, I'm going to retire, going to come home, you know, we'll work on everything. Then before you knew it, 36, I'm still right, going Right, so that it. was in the States, right, being in college. So you end up finishing your degree or no? Yes, I have actually. That that's a that's a great move. Yeah, I really, 
appreciate people that they finish yeah. the degree and actually play basketball. And this is the route. Like here in the States, you really have to, to go to the NBA, right? You, they draft you from the college league. And I feel the college league is as good as the NBA on a college level. Like I've seen people betting money on college basketball in the States like crazy. Like it's so much... Um, compared to the NBA, did you feel that much pressure where you were playing, you know, um, in uh, which state was it? Uh, Connecticut, UConn. Connecticut, yeah. yeah. How was the pressure while you were playing there in college? Um, when I was in Connecticut, it wasn't, it wasn't really no pressure. I mean, for me, it was the, uh, the only memory that I really have. It was kind of like the like it was just like you was having a dream. To me, every time I look back, it was just like a dream to me. I mean, the only time that I really kind of was like, I remember, was the first play um, we were playing, I don't know. I mean, me coming out of high school, I was playing, you know, a small forward. Uh, and sometimes I play, you know, point guard because I was like six eight at the time. And I came down first time, started from day one. So we play playing against... Um, who were playing? I think it was um I think it was DePaul. So and DePaul at the time my cousin was a junior at DePaul. And so the whole family, I'm talking about the whole everybody in the family was watching. So I came down, got the rebound, went between the legs, between the legs, you know, and shot it fade away three. So the ball bounced. We got we got the tip in. Stanley got the rebound and you know finished it. And I looked and I saw coach call a timeout. So then I'm looking to tap St uh, uh, Stanley up, you know, say like, good rebound. I look back, the coach was in my face. And all I heard was the MFs and the the D word and everything. And he was just like, who do you think you are? You, you, you're you not NBA? What, what is this? Man, I never heard. Right. For the next week straight, I was hearing about it. Like... You know, and wow. I mean, that's probably the only experience that I heard so that I can like remember very clearly. So, yeah, they're tough there. They're tough. They don't they don't joke there. Yeah. Right. Especially in college, your whole tuition depends on how do you perform. Mm -hmm. And they're like investing a lot of money on you. So that's that's actually a very good uh, point. Yeah. So I'm going to start with the Q&A's. We have a lot of questions. So I will do my best to make sure we summarize all the questions. All right. So Fakhri77 is asking you, where would you rank the Lebanese league compared to the other leagues? Uh, is that including Europe? <laughs> I think he didn't ask, but let's say you're, let's say first in the Arab leagues and then you're an Arab in, the, in Africa too. Let's put it in Africa slash Middle East and then we'll put it uh, compared to Europe. Uh, I mean, in the Arab world, it's number one. <laughs> Hands down. That's not even what it is. I can't even say anything. It's number one, completely. You know, you play in Lebanon, you go everywhere else, like, you find the league easier. You play anywhere else in, in, the, in the Arab world, you come to Lebanon, you find it tough. So that tells you exactly what it is. Um, comparing to the African League, uh, I mean, it, it depends. You know, I would say, like, it, it's probably a tie. Uh, you know, it's just... It's different because Africans play a different style of basketball. They play, you know, like almost Eastern European type of basketball, f rough, physical, s fast, athletic. You know, it might not be as skilled, but oh, you're going to leave that game, you know, bruised up. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like pretty much, you know, tied with a, with a lot of African teams. All right. So someone is asking, and this one is in Arabic, so we'll probably have to respond in Arabic. So <laughs> would AT Hayirja al Muntahab Libnan? Um I mean it's time and situation. Uh time and situation and uh you know, we'll 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 see what happens. You know, for me I I, I don't know yet. Um you, you know, when I put on the Lebanese jersey, you know, it's a it's a great honor and it's a great pride. Um, but I've come to a place in, in my life and in my career that I have a different mission and a different goal, you know. Um, so 
when the, if that opportunity presents itself, yeah, I'll take it. But if it doesn't present itself, um, you know, there's 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 other things that I can prioritize. So. So when you talk about mission and goals, you feel like committing to the national team is a lot, or it's not. It's not. You're not interested in it, or you want to prioritize family. Can you tell me a little bit more about what do you mean by prioritizing? I mean playing for the national team. It's not. You're not just putting on a club uniform. You're not putting on a Sajazo or Riyadi. You're combining all those uniforms and you're putting them on at the same time. You know, and that is very, very... A lot of people take it very lightly, but for me, it's, I don't take it lightly. So that's like a very heavy commitment. That's like you got to go with, with full focus, no distractions, cancel out every other thing that you have going on at that time uh, and put 100% in. Um, you know, if that happens for me, that's, you know, that's exactly what I would do, you know, because it's like a, you know, it's like a soldier being called up to the, to the front line. It's like, dude, it's time to defend the flag. So I, I'm, I'm ready, whatever. But at the same time, um, I've also, you know, my father and my family have always so been talking to me about the possibility of, you know, representing South Sudan in the Olympics. Um, you know, it was my grandma's dying wish um you know to see me in a south sudan jersey uh which she she cannot because you know she passed away um but i i want to make that happen and i know she can you know when if that happens i know that she's going to be able to see me still you know from heaven so wow that's nice and you never played for uh, sudan right okay so Karim El Baba 2009 is asking you who is the best foreign player who you played with in Lebanon? Damn, why are you going to throw me under the bus like that? <laughs> Man. <laughs> you know who I'm going to say, Pierre. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So and he's asking you who's the best Lebanese player you played with in Lebanon? I'm probably going to get crucified for this. Uh, well, for me, for me personally, for me personally, um, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's tough. So I'll have to go with, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. But All right, let's give me, give me a couple. Give me two. Um, I mean, Rodrigue, you know, for me, I love playing with Rodrigue because he's a floor general. He's going to talk to you. He, you know, he plays with poise, with calm. Um, and playing with him, you know, with Beirut and now with Sajas, it was, it's, you know, and also with the national team. Um, I've seen this thing in him where it's like, yeah, you're the leader of the team. I'll follow you. You know, I'll follow you to hell and back. You know, he has that. And he doesn't have to yell or cuss or say any any of those stuff, you know. He just has that calm demeanor where you are able to listen and follow him. Um, then you have, of course, you have, you know, Wild. You know, uh, he he's the complete opposite of Rodrik. So he has that, let's get it, you know. So, you know, that's definitely, you know, it's good to play with him always. Um, and I, And I'll say... Who would be my favorite? It's tough, man. I, I can't. I can't even call it. What about Fatty? Yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely Fatty. Fatty. I'll say Fatty is like up there as well. You know. Um, you know, but Fatty's a veteran though. Fatty, he's he's gonna do everything. You know, kind of like very laid back where I am now. You know, <laughs> he's gonna do everything laid back, but definitely <laughs> not for me. I'll say like Rodrigue. Wild fatty and 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 I'll add Ali Haida in there. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a great that's a great option. Yeah. Someone and, and also you, and also don't forget yeah. uh, don't forget Amir. Yeah. You know? Right. So I had I, I had this question. Someone is asking. Actually, the same guy Karim is asking you Wael or Amir in your opinion. Two different position, two different mindsets, two different style of game. So can't call you can't pick one or another, depending on what the team needs. Right. Yeah. If a team needs a point guard, you go with Wild. If a team needs a shooter or a scorer, you go with uh Amir. 
Correct, yeah. yeah. Anis Mokni is asking you, when you will come back to the U.S. Monastery of Tunisia? Um, <laughs> I mean, inshallah, inshallah soon. Uh, maybe this ball or the next ball coming up, inshallah. All right, Carla is asking the same question. Carla, we already um, asked him the question, so we're not going to say it. Elio Jeha, he's asking, asking you in Arabic too. Who five weeks? I will coach Bedoye Basa five weeks. Uh it's just it's just uh how everything was set up, how all the chips fell into place. Uh, I mean we'll we'll see after you know, we'll, we'll definitely do a reevaluation uh after this contract is done and we'll see, you know, you know, what's the best option for me and what's that best option for the, for the team, whatever the team, you know, whatever fits the team. Obviously, me, I always put the team above myself. So if the team, you know, needs me, then, of course, you know, I'm going to be available. Uh, if the team needs another player to be successful, definitely, you know, I, I don't have, you know, know how feelings, but it's like it's just depending on, on the team needs at the time, so. Right. Ibrahim Yaoubi is asking you why you weren't happy to stay with Riyadi the last season. Damn. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nah, it's, 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 not, it's nothing crazy like that. Uh, I mean, I, I knew it was, it was a matter of time before that question came up. Um, I mean, I signed with Riyadi for the whole year and, um, you know, the 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 guaranteed portion of the contract was pretty much up um and at the time you know I, I've had, I was going through a lot of uh you know death in my family and you know the mental space of mine it was just like it kind of coincided with everything that was happening within the team you know the team started in one place and you know they needed to win and they they were heading down that direction, so we came to, down to a mutual agreement. All right, so it wasn't like it wasn't like something happened, right? Something happened or no, like internal conflict or personal conflict? Oh no no no, me I don't I don't have my teammates or my brothers. I never have internal conflicts with nobody, not with the coach, not with the players, not with nobody. I'm I'm okay with every single player on that team. Every single I'll play for reality again and you know i'll play with any of those guys i'll play for coach ahmed farhan definitely a, he's a great coach i'll play for him again but you know it was just like how the chips fell at that moment of time and one thing that people don't understand is that i got a lot of backlash for leaving reality but it's like okay i left reality i got blessed to, to to be you know in angola to play for Petro, which is, you know, there's a lot of blessing that came playing for Petro that people don't see, you know, for me personally. And then it's like, Riyadi, you guys happen to get another South Sudanese who's younger, who's the NBA bound. You know, you, you get to, you got Diop, you know, out of me leaving. So, you know, both sides got blessed. So it's like, it, it, everything happens for a reason, you know, because if I didn't leave Riyadi, Riyadi was not going to see Diop. They weren't going to focus on Diop. But then because I left, they were desperate to get the up. So now they got to see the benefit of a younger South Sudanese player. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a blessing for both sides. George McCurry is asking you, do you have a contract with the team in Ball in January or somewhere else? If not, it's an option to renew with SAG. I mean, suggest. I think he, he's talking about suggest. Um, I mean, I have a lot of offers on the table, but really not focused on it right now. I, uh, once my contract is fulfilled with Suggest, then I'll focus on um, figuring out what, what my next move is. But for now, I'm not even considering anything or not focused on anything. So, All right, one step at a time, right? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not so much about one step at a time. It's like if you're doing something and then you're thinking about what, what's the next step, so it means that your foot is already out. So then you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing at the time. You know. So for me, it, it doesn't like operate focus on what you're doing right now and then once you get to that bo line then you figure out okay i can negotiate i can renegotiate i can you know go to another team figure out another contract so yeah so teo is asking you who was the best team you faced in the lebanese league the be i mean 
on paper, the best team was uh, Jeremy Pargo, J.J. Hickson, Fadi Khatib, Ahmed Ibrahim, all them guys. You know, on paper, that was the, probably the best team that I faced. Uh, you know, and but we, you know, we did what we had to do. So, all right. So I have one more comment. Um, D. N. Guba, he's he's telling you that you are the goat. No cap. <laughs> I'm not no goat, man. I'm just I'm just a man trying to, you know, make a living. So, you know, um, a lot of people, they they do the whole hype thing. And nah, you can never be too high. You can never be too low. And you always, you know, run run your lane, which God provided to you. You know, always stay humble. You know, always stay focused on what you got to do. Uh, I don't do that whole, you know, a lot of people don't see me doing the whole celebration thing because it's like okay it's, you know you don't get too high you don't get too low because that's just how life is so right it's nice i was talking to rodrigue i was talking also to patrick baboud and all those players they're veteran in the league they are sharing the same stories like you just have to be consistent there's no two highs or two lows and even like i'm a big fan of kobe Bryant, and um he's one of the, his podcasts he mentioned like just stay still you know whatever happens you know life keeps going there's tomorrow there's next year there's you know five years ahead so we just have to be you know humble and keep going and i feel like that's a, a good way to put it now you know what Atar, i really want to hear you talking in arabic <laughs> so, uh, no. i don't know i don't know how comfortable you are <laughs> حلو yeah. وين تعلمت عربي مصري هونيك بمصر؟ ايه yeah, شوية في مصر uh, and also uh, انا واحد من من الناس like uh, لو في شيء انا بدي اعمله uh, انا بعلم نفسي فاهم الموضوع like انا I'll go do my own research to teach myself so a lot of Arabic that I've learned is actually self-taught Nice, nice. Hello. I really like your character. I mean, I think you're an inspiration for a lot of us. I mean, I was really surprised about your story. I really like it and inspirational too. Atar, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I mean, it was a pleasure to have you and good luck with Sages, um this year. And do you have anything you want to tell the fans before, you know, we're done with the podcast? Uh, no, I mean, you know, it's an honor being here and uh, talking. Uh, you know, hopefully one day you'll hear the full story of my life. Uh, I mean, if we could sit here for hours. You should do a book about it. <laughs> uh, no, actually, they have a documentary coming out uh, about the the ball and first season of the ball. So that uh, I, I I talk about it a lot more on there, and uh, even you know the details of um, the draft situation and me leaving the Lakers. Uh, I talk about details of my life, and you know goes through everything of my life. So. You know, be on the lookout for that one. So I don't need a book. It's gonna you're gonna hear one way or another. So right, that's awesome, amazing man. And don't forget also, guys, to subscribe if you like the podcast on YouTube. You can also like us and leave us a comment. Atar, it was very nice and uh, good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, definitely, I'll be seeing you around. And uh, to all the Hikma fans, show up on Wednesday. We're definitely gonna do the best we can. We're gonna try to kill it. Yeah. Also, Atar, uh, I don't know if you know, I'm doing a giveaway for the game versus Riyadi. I'm giving 10 free tickets for whoever liked this uh, video. Comment mm. and subscribe. And the comment just like they have just to leave a comment that they subscribed and they will have a chance to win a free ticket versus Sages, um, Riyadi Sages and Ghazir. How do you feel about that game? And uh, are you excited? Wait, is the game in Ghazir or is it in Manara? No, I think it's in Ghazir. Oof. Man, listen. I, I, I'll I, give... I'll, so you give 10 tickets, I'll give 10 tickets. How about that? <laughs> I, no, no, I'm serious. I like that. I'm serious. Really? Yeah, I, I'll give, right, I'll give so 10 guys, tickets. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below that you subscribe. You'll have a chance to win it. Yeah, so I'll talk to you about the details off camera about the, the 10 tickets, but I got you. So guys, <laughs> if, you li if you like, subscribe... You're going to be able to, you know, win a, one of 20 tickets or two of 20 tickets. So, 
go ahead i love i love that i love that yeah. cool cool yeah definitely thank you for having me and uh it's it's definitely an honor